amen. I don't know about you, but I've been called a few things. Some things I enjoy, some things are not appropriate to be uttered here. You may have been called by a business, a consumer, the customer, and you may or may not have been always right. You may have been so lucky as someone has turned to you and said, you are the love of my life. You may have experienced the heartache of being someone's ex. You also might have experienced the freedom of being someone's ex, but you might have experienced the heartache of it all. You might be suspect number one. But of all the things I have been called, being called salty by Jesus, I mean, come on. Some of that is my modern interpretation of what it means to be called salty. This is not what Jesus means. See, salt at the time of Jesus had a bit more of a tool, an ecumenical, a, a usefulness to it. By the way, people come to sermons and they're looking for like a lighter, a like how can I use this in my daily life? Here is the most honest to God, best thing you can ever, like hard rock advice from a sermon you will ever hear. If your salt is iodized, get rid of it. Go get kosher salt, Morton's kosher salt. It's a blue box. It's so much better. <laughs> we might argue about the nature of the Trinity and Jesus' divineness, but I will not handle the heresy that kosher salt is not infinitely better. <laughs> Just saying. So, salt in the time of Jesus had particular attributes. It was like the goal of it. One, it, of course it was meant to flavor food. Like that's the natural course of it. But it also has a preservative nature to it. This is before refrigeration. You can salt meat at room temperature and it will last forever. Don't try it with iodized salt. <laughs> this is a whole process of this. So, if salt is meant to pre both preserve and enhance. It's a similar, this is the same connection that Jesus is trying to make when he calls us light. Light unto itself is a rather blinding, but the usefulness of light is being able to see what light hits. It brings out, it amplifies. You get to see what light is touching. You wanna get lost real quick? Listen to astrophysicists and talk about whether or not you can actually see light. It gets over my head in a real hurry. But they grant that the beauty of light is not into it of itself, but what light touches. This, dear friends, is the work of the church. Whether it's salt or light, sprinkle a little church on things and we are supposed to enhance the flavor. We are supposed to make things better, taste better, preserve just a little bit longer. We are supposed to, you take a tender moment that you have with your loved one, sprinkle a little church on it. It's supposed to go down a little easier. You're committed to another person. You want to spend your life with them. Sprinkle a little church on it. It's supposed to draw you both even deeper in love with each other and to God. You're an awkward junior high kid who's trying to make it in the world, sprinkle a little church on it. You know what we're, that's supposed to do? Assure you that no matter how bad your haircut turned out, you are still graced, embraced, and loved by God. That your internal worth is not decided by your braces. Or whether or not you got a date for prom. Or, if, no, I won't go there. If you're facing your mortality, your body is not acting as it should or it's breaking down. You're supposed to sprinkle a little church on it and you're supposed to be assured not only of eternal life right now, but eternal life when your heart stops beating, when your body eventually gives way. This, dear friends, is what the church is meant to be. We are meant to sprinkle a little church on the things 
where the, world, where the world wants to decay us, we are meant to preserve that which is good in the world. Sprinkle a little, if there's ignorance, sprinkle a little church on it, and we're supposed to promote education. Spr- see a little disaster, sprinkle some church on it, we're bringing consolation. If there's despair, sprinkle a little church, you get hope. We're spent to draw it out. If there's loneliness, the church is meant to be the accompaniment that brings out companionship. And where there's hatred for fe- fellow human beings, where the church is meant to be, we are meant to preserve that which is love. And while we know this to be our mission, this is what we are called to be so often. Jesus then has this next line, if salt loses its saltiness, it is not meant for much more than casting out on the road and being trampled. Well, we're just getting out of the season where that's actually a use, Jesus. <laughs> Throw it on my roof, please. If it's, run out of its, if it's run out of its cooking potential, it can surely get rid of my ice dam. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus is getting at. What Jesus is getting at is what, it, it's, 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 it's a, and I have lost the word. <laughs> It's hyperbole, that's it. Jesus is using this gigantic language. It is a clear joke for a salt, salt can't lose its saltiness. It is not losing its essential nature. If you lose your essential nature, what are you good for? If you lose the ability to be you, what is it for? If the church forgot what its call, what its essential job, we've, we've never done that, have we? Not the big C. No, 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 no. The big universal church. We have never lost track. We have never lost our saltiness. Of course we have. And I, 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 get, to, I get to do the big things. That's easy to swallow. Or at least, at least more widely known where, you know, the church has lost its saltiness when it comes to anti-Semitism. We were in bed with Jim Crow laws and systemic racism, Islamophobia, hate crimes to just about everybody, including our LGBTQI plus uh, brothers and sisters, to the generations of women who were kept in abusive relationships because of the stigma of divorce propagated by our churches. Parents guilted out of sanctuaries because their kids were just being kids. The one true opinion being held up as the premier and only truth over people. This, sisters and brothers, is when the church has lost its saltiness. And it's easy to point the finger out at like the church. I haven't been here, I haven't been at Spirit of Hope long enough to point out y'all. This is just where I've seen it in bigger churches or in the bigger universal church. But as I've always said, whenever we talk about Jesus, whenever we bring up the Bible, you want to read the Bible correctly? Where are you in it? You got to read yourself in it. And where have I lost my saltiness? When I haven't protected my peace. When I have said yes to every single person who's ever wanted something of me so that when I get home, my kids get a run down, torn up, washed out version of dad. And they have to say dad like six or seven times before I'm there. Dad, 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 dad. Oh yeah, what? Because I was too aloof thinking of something else. Where have I lost my saltiness? When I have let spiritual scars Wounds from a previous life, previous church, previous time shape how I'm looking at someone new because I'm too busy being reminded of how they remind me of somebody I used to know. I have lost my saltiness when I want to be nice more nice, Minnesota nice. I want to be that more than I want to be Christian. I want to preserve my, how are things going when I ask? And what I want you to do is talk through your teeth 
and the smile and say, things are fine because I don't have time to actually hear what's really going on. When I think about this, when I think about all the ways that I'm not worthy, when I feel comfortable going, yep, I'm the kind of salt that's used for the road or the roof. That's when I start realizing, I'm like, okay, so I'm getting a little down. But I'm reminded about who Jesus is speaking to and when Jesus is speaking. This is Matthew chapter 5. How far along in the gospel are we? This started, like, Matthew chapter 5 started with the Beatitudes. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He just got back from his desert. These aren't like well-trained disciples who've been following him for three and a half years and have performed miracles themselves. This is Jesus at the start of his ministry, standing on the mountain, looking at, at the opening of Matthew 5. It says, the crowds came to see him. Seeing that, he ascended the mountain. Because, so he's talking to the crowds. Now, I'm okay, but like, when you think of the crowds, how many of them do you think have their life put together? How many of the crowds pass background checks? How many from the crowds haven't been suspect number one or defendant? When the crowds come to Jesus, how many of these people feel inherently worthy of being called the light of the world? Because that's what Jesus is in this. When I say, where do you find yourself? Sometimes I say to myself, I am the salt that is cast into the road. But when Jesus is looking at this, when Jesus sees me, Jesus sees the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Jesus sees all my inadequacies, all my imperfections, all the ways I do not measure up and says, you are worthy. You bring out the love of the world. You bring out the compassion. You you are a companion to those in need. You are the healer that the people need right now. And I am so scared. <laughs> because Jesus believes in me. And that's the good news for you. Jesus believes in you. Whenever an opportunity to show love shows up, you can talk yourself out of it. I shouldn't call them because they're probably going through some stuff. Uh, if I, they, they're already getting enough cards. They don't need a gift card. It's a, it's, it, all I have is this $5 gift card. It won't make a difference. What can I do? And even with this platform as a pastor, there's times where you don't feel adequate. And then stuff like this week happened. Before I left for my retreat, I'm sitting with my boy, my eldest. And Calvin says to me, Dad, I need to talk. He's nine. <laughs> okay. I need to ask you something. Whoa, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like, what's going on? He's like, what do you, where's my camera? Which camera am I on? Okay, that one. What do you know about r slavery? <laughs> uh... I pull the best parent move I got. Well, what do you know about slavery? <laughs> right? And he goes, Dad, I just need to tell you, people like us, white people, we made black people work all day and they never got to play. And I'm like, that's right. That's, that, that happened. And he goes, and you know what? We did it for so long that even when slavery ended, we were so bossy that sometimes it's like picking your nose. You don't even know you're doing it. <laughs> for a third 
third grader, that's phenomenal. Like that's, you don't even know you're doing it. You're, you're so boss. I'm like, bud, uh, great. Let's talk about this later. <laughs> uh, it's like, I, <laughs> then he goes, don't tell mom about slavery. <laughs> I don't think she can handle it. <laughs> when I think to myself that, uh, uh, what, can, what, I don't think in my lifetime I'm going to see the end of any of the problems, any of the ways that the church has failed the world, but I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure he does. That's all I got. I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna see the end of racial discrimination or anti-LGBTQ actions or gun violence or I don't even know if I can get the church universal to start seeing the next generation as the lifeblood and the current church. I don't know if I can form the United Methodist Church to be an accepting and inclusive place, but I am gonna do everything I can to pull that flavor out, to preserve that which is good, wholesome, and right to the best of my ability. And that is all I can do. And I am only one grain of salt, and I'm looking for a shaker. Amen. <laughs>